Keep that one handy. There's a lot of talk right now about revival. Asbury College is experiencing a moving of the Holy Spirit. I haven't done a lot of research into it. I'm sure not going to criticize it. There's one thing I don't criticize is someone else's experience. Because I don't know how God is working in your life. If you tell me Jesus came in a white robe and stood at the end of your bed, I'm going to say, I am really happy for you. But I do know this, that we have the same Holy Spirit. I'm not looking forward to or trying to prime or puff up people for some great emotional experience. And we're going to talk by the end of this message, what is true revival? Cindy and I prayed this morning for you all, and we prayed for personal revival. Now, if you revive someone, that means they weren't dead. They were just sluggish. There was some signs of life. That's why we have an AED machine here. You that are in the medical field. When someone is fully dead and you bring them back from the dead, that's called a resurrection. But we're all spiritually dead until we're born again. Bible says we're dead in trespasses and trespasses and sins. You say, no, I'm a good person. Bible says there's none good. The preacher's not good. The Pope's not good. We're all sinners. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a sinner that needed a Savior. And today our, our theme is what can we as a church do? And there are people that are listening to us on our Facebook Live. And today we have something extra, because our words that are spoken, the singing doesn't work quite as well, but every word that's spoken today is being trans, transmitted on a website that the hearing impaired can actually see the words we're saying. And Carol, your daughter and I practiced this week on it, and Carol is going to be able to enjoy our revival the interpreter that's coming with the trip with the team is not quite as experienced as last week's and last year's interpreter. So we prayed, and I met these men at the Southern Baptist State Convention. It's called Polyglossia. And they sent us a device. We had to program it to our internet. And we practiced on it. How many of you were my practice buddies? I thank you very much for helping me saying, yes, I got it. And I turned on a CD from a previous message and just let it play and see if it would work. So today, Carol is getting to join us on the webpage uh, of Polyglossia to hear the words. So that's something that I'm excited about. Anybody here tired? It's all the time. Living makes you tired. Now, dead people aren't tired. <laughs> They're done. But sometimes, we just get weary. Maybe we went to bed before 9 o'clock last night. It was wonderful. Yes, Lord. But at 4 o'clock, my body said, get up and work. And I said, no, body. No, I'm not doing that. But I'm praying we can not only be spiritually revived, but we can be physically revived. Our prayer list was very long today. And, and really, that's not everybody, but those are the urgent ones. But the big question here is the big if. Here's the verse, and it's on your half sheet. You might want to fold that so you can follow along. I made it so you can put it in your Bible. But I also made it so you could put some notes on the inside if you want to. That's why I didn't do a front and back half sheet. So you could possibly make some notes. I want to be revived. I want to be encouraged. And here's our key verse. And that key verse is on your page and it's also on the screen. Would you read it please with me? 2 Chronicles 7, 14 together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive 
forget their sin and heal their land. Now I realize in the context of 2 Chronicles that was written to Israel, but I believe it is very applicable to us. Our land needs healing. And it's going to start with your heart and your home, your family, your neighborhood, your church, in Greensville County. Do you realize what a privilege and honor it is that our revival team is going to go into every public school in Greensville County? Can we all say amen? Amen. Now we can't for hey, I'll, I'll praise the Lord. We can't, we can't give the gospel. But we can shine the light. And we're also going to be with full invitation at Brunswick Academy. And they allow us to preach and share the gospel there. We're going to uh, uh, be in all the schools here in town. And Mark is going to share a message on hope. Some of the kids are going to share a message on their survival. Brother George is going to be with us in the high school in the 8th grade sharing a message about mothers against drunk driving. And so it's going to be an awesome opportunity. And I've had prayer with every principal the administrators. I get to meet with all the guidance counselors last week. And around the table, <coughs> Nicole Coker and Tammy Hand and I with the counselors were able to pray together. <coughs> Hallelujah. There is prayer in our public schools because our teachers are praying for God to do a work. And we hope that if the children see what we're doing in the assembly, that they'll come and bring their parents to the revival. But here's the big if. Now, I've got some verses printed for you. I've started to have you turn to all of them. I thought, I'll drop them crazy. I started to put them on the page, but I wanted you to take these home. And I'm begging you, church, would you study these verses all week? Yes, we're having a day of fasting and prayer, which means that the Bible study, we're not going to pig out like we usually do. Pete, we're going to celebrate your birthday. Pete Gordon, happy birthday, but we're not having any cake last, this week. We ate it last week. Okay? <laughs> we ate your cake at Bible study. But we're going to gather. And we may have half the crowd we normally do, or we may have double. I don't know. But we're going to gather Wednesday. And all of you that can come, this is not an eat event. We're going to have ice water. Okay? We're going to pray. And we're going to study the scriptures on fasting and prayer. You say, well, you're supposed to fast privately and it's not supposed to be a public matter. Many times in the scriptures, <coughs> fasting was a public matter. And after we studied the book of Esther, I told the Bible study crowd, we've had about 25 coming every Wednesday at 11. I told them, we need to proclaim a fast for this county, for our homes, for our churches, every church in downtown is cooperating with this revival. Now, I believe that's called the millennium, if you can get a bunch of churches. <laughs> but every denomination, there's actually one church that, that has, has not cooperated, but they have a different doctrine, so that's okay. But they're going to be there. This is not a time for preachers to advertise. I'm not going to be on the platform. It's going to be Mark and the team and God. The superintendent of schools is opening the meeting on Monday night. We need the Lord. We need the power. But how are we going to have revival? Let's look at these key words. First of all, he said, my people. Look on your sheet. Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind high on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. What is humility? Humility is thinking more of God and somebody else than I do myself. And do you know that's a constant battle? To put others first? But Paul wrote to the Roman church and he said, Associate with the humble and do not be wise in your own opinion. <laughs> Folks, if you want to have revival, you've got to quit worrying about me first. You've got to quit saying, but I think, and therefore I'm right. It's called humility. 
Psalm 1827. Read it with me, please. It's on your sheet. For you will save the humble people, but will bring down haughty looks. You know what that means? People who look down on others. I'm better. I'm higher. I'm mightier. I'm powerful. The psalmist wrote, God will bring down haughty looks. He will save the humble. But another key word is to pray. If my people, which are called by my name, the only way to be God's people is to be born again. It is not baptism and church membership and good works and church attendance. Jason mentioned the first Sunday after the rapture. One of you deacons will have to open up. <laughs> Just a little joke. Just a little joke. <laughs> I won't be here. Not because I'm so good. It's because I'm so saved. I've given Jesus my heart. 52, 3 years ago, I gave Jesus my soul. But the first Sunday after the rapture, somebody's going to show up for church. If you've seen the Left Behind movies, the day of the rapture, they propose that people will be flocking to the church looking for some answers. Because all the things they've heard, they realize are true. But my people means God's people, God's children. But he said, humble yourself and the next word, pray. Look at James 4, 6. Please read it with me. I want, I just, I'm so excited about this. I want you to get it. And I don't mind staying until 12 o'clock today. And I know you don't either. Last week, y'all got out at 11.30. You were on vacation. And I was out of town, all right? But we only get together once a week. So to me, an hour and a half together is wonderful. I'd stay at 1 o'clock. Okay, you can. All right. <laughs> you you going to bring the pizza? <laughs> I will. <laughs> James 4, 6. Read it with me, please. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And then verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I want to tell you what is humility. Humility is getting at this altar. Or getting on your knees at your house if you're physically capable. Or getting lying prostate. I always mess that word up. Prostrate is the angels of all the fall. Okay. I wish I could erase that on the little thing there. Quit laughing. You drove all the way to the lab that didn't But the Bible speaks of lying face down before God. Now, there's some churches that fall out and lay down and do all kind of interesting things. Both one time my kids were at a Susanna and Rebecca were at a youth conference and they called home. They said, Dad, is, is it all right if we raise our hands? A lot of these kids are raising their hands. You know, this back, you know, the Baptists didn't do that much. And I said, girls. Whatever you're doing makes you feel closer to God. The scripture says lift holy hands. But make sure you're going to do it on Monday after you do it on Sunday. That's when you're really worshiping. When you and God are alone and nobody's watching. And you're lifting your hands to God and saying, dear Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. By the way, Tori and Layla. Would you please be ready to close our service with that song today? Did you know I was going to do that? <laughs> well, I'm glad the Lord told you. <laughs> well, it fits. Caleb had another plan back here, but we need the Lord. Can you do it by yourself? No way. He said, humble yourself and seek. The next key word, seek his face. Now, we haven't seen God. There are instances of the people in Scripture that saw the backside of God or the angel, the, the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. But I've never seen God and I've never heard His voice. But I know in my heart 
when God speaks to me and it is in line with the scripture. That's the voice of God. Look at Psalm 69, 32. Read it with me, please. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. Now, gladness and joy are, doesn't mean there's the absence of trouble. The true joy is when we can rejoice in the middle of trouble. When I can, it's just like Sue saying it. God wants to hear you sing when you're in the jail. He loves to hear our praises on those joyful days, but he also loves to hear us sing while we're in the, the prison. He said, seek his face. If you are harboring and I are harboring secret sins in our life, we can't seek God's face. Because God knows the real you. He knows the real me. He knows us so well. And that's not trying to put people on a guilt trip. You better be good because he's watching you. Well, you can't seek the face of God and have something in your back pocket that you're going, well, I'm going to give God everything I've got except this one little thing. That it's not very harmful. It's something I think about or it's something I might practice. It's something no one knows about, you think. You cannot seek the face of God and harbor secret sins. There's, it's like there's a wall between you and the Holy Spirit's power. Because he said the next thing, turn. When you turn around, it's an about face. It is, I'm going in a direction. Acts 3.19 says, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. I learned that verse teaching Bible clubs when I was 15 years old. And it's in deep in my heart. Repent and be converted. Be changed. Why are we having a revival meeting at the elementary auditorium? First of all, by the graciousness of this church, we have put out $2,500 to bring this team here and to rent the auditorium. And churches all over town are bringing us food and bedding. And they're helping us. But we're doing it because we wanted to have this revival team. And look, we're 80% filled right now. We could cram 140 people in here and use the overflow room and down the hall and set up chairs. But it wouldn't be a good idea. It wouldn't be safe or even legal with the fire codes. But we are renting a 900-seat auditorium. Hello? That's a lot of chairs. And that's why when you leave here today, Alicia's going to be at the back forcing you to take one of these. <laughs> uh, asking you, okay? I need these all over town. We need them in every surrounding county. We paid them. God bless us with people who paid for this printing. But we need you to take these to the gas station, the food line, to everywhere you shop this week. Ask the manager. Can I please put this up for display? Why? Because we want people to hear the good news. Mark and Valerie and their team have been traveling for months now. They took a break at Christmas. And I, I had a phone conference with Mark this week. And I said, man, I cannot imagine how tired you are. He said, Rick, I will I'll tell you, we're tired. And we're going to be tired when we leave Forest Hill. Because I've seen the schedule. And, and because... They might go to a church that has a Christian school and they do one chapel every day. But we've got them in one one day, they're going to three different schools or three different classes, assemblies in one day. Why? Because we want to get the news out. It said, turn from sin. Look at Psalm 119, 37. Please read with me on your sheet. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. You may not be able to physically fast this week. I'm not asking you to go seven days without eating, and I'm not asking anyone what they're doing. And neither is my wife asking me, and vice versa. This is a matter between you and the Lord. 
But we are asking that Wednesday, if you can, be a day. Now, last week was Ash Wednesday, according to the ecclesiastical calendar, where they take the ashes of last year's palms, burn them, and put the cross on their forehead. I've done that. I've been in schools and in churches that did that. We didn't observe Fat Tuesday where you get drunk real good so, so you can be good for the next 50 days. Uh, uh, we, we're not Mardi Gras kind of people around here. But I want to ask you to observe this as a time of Lord search my heart. He said, stop looking at worthless things. We all know what that means. This was written before television. This was written before Facebook and cell phones. If David was out in the middle of a field with a bunch of sheep and, and, and monitoring them, what in the world could there be worthless to look at? But in God's word, he inspired the writer to say, stop looking at worthless things. It may be that you take a fast from your phone. Or from social media. Some of you wives would like to take a fast from your husband. <laughs> You've been gone for a couple of days, George. No, no, no. I just said George. I didn't mean you, George. No, I <laughs> In the fasting, in, in many churches, it's like giving up something for Lent, L E N T. The time before Easter. But that's a matter between you and God. Something that's precious to you. That, that you could spend that time praying. He said, man, I don't know how to pray that long. I've got a list of 160 people that have come to this church. One time or another. There's about 70 or 80 of you here today. But the list is of attenders only. Not members. I've got, we've got members I haven't seen in years. But I'm talking about attenders that we need to pray for. I'll give you that list. You will be surprised how long you can pray if you just get along with God and talk to the Lord. He said then, all right, here's the results. Then, they turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. Look at the next verse, Daniel 10, 12. Read it with me, please. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. The king believed the words of Daniel. Why? Because Daniel was consistent. He said, Then I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive. Hearing it requires listening. Remember a sermon I did a while back? It was just entitled, Listen. One of the best love languages is to listen. Proverbs 6, 3. Read it please with me. Go do, excuse me. So do this, my son, and deliver yourself. For you have come into the hand of your friend. Go and humble yourself. Plead with your friend. Humility might be, mean I'm sorry. And not apologizing so you can get a reciprocal apology. Well, I said I'm sorry, aren't you? No, that's not, that's not repentance and that's not sorrow. I'm sorry means for my part in this problem, I am sorry. He said there will be forgiveness. You have a sheet that you're going to take home with you today that I reprinted from gotquestions.org, which is my favorite go-to spot. If you've got a biblical question or just a question about life, you go to gotquestions.org, put in the keywords, just a few keywords. But I've heard this from so many people. I know I'm forgiven by God, but I just can't forgive myself. Do you know you don't have the capacity to forgive yourself? Because you didn't die on the cross. You didn't pay the price for forgiveness. Jesus did. Have you ever gone before the judge and you knew you were guilty? 
and the judge said, you're forgiven, there's not a person in here that says, but sir or ma'am, I just, I would, let me go ahead and pay for this. Well, they'll let you pay court costs, okay? <laughs> but, no, I think I need to spend a few years in jail. Well, I, we have forgiven you. We have, we have not declared you guilty. You were declared innocent. Nobody in their right mind would go, but, but, judge, I, I want to be guilty. I want to serve. I, I want to serve my time. I want to pay my penalty. No, we would all leave there going, thank God. Even if you were guilty and you were forgiven. But what do we do to God? God says, you're forgiven. Your sins are washed away. They're under the blood of Christ. And we go, but God, I, I still want to feel guilty. You know what he's saying to you? I don't know what you're talking about. Because it's gone. It's forgiven. So many scriptures. Layla sings the song, East to West. That God says, your sins are as far as East is from the West. And when you accept that forgiveness, and I want you to please read this document carefully and share it with others because every one of us carry this burden of guilt on our back of things we wish we had done differently or regrets or things we wish we'd never said or things that we want to be forgiven for. And you keep asking for forgiveness for something that God has already said, this is settled. Stop. Have you ever forgiven someone and they want to bring it up? You know what you need to say is, I don't know what you're talking about. And we're not going to talk about this again. Ever. It's over. Hallelujah. And then the healing comes. I will heal your land. Look at 1 Peter 5.5. 5. This is Peter writing to the church together. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, humble doesn't mean I'm going to let you run me over. Humble is not I'm a doormat. Humble is I've accepted God's forgiveness, and I am cleansed through the blood of Christ. Look at verse 6. Read with me, please. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Praise God. Psalm 119, 88, with me. Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. And then 1 Peter 5, 8, another Scripture on resisting temptation. Verse 8 of 1 Peter 5. Together. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion. Seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And Psalm 71 says, you who have shown me great and severe troubles. Have you had any severe troubles? Well, if you're older than about 10 years old, I can assure you, you have. Shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. 1 Peter 5.10, please read with me. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you to him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Please take this verse sheet home and read it with your family. If you're not having family Bible reading together, you're missing one of the greatest joys of life. We're honored to have Caleb's parents with us this weekend. And last night, his, his dad, Mr. Riddle, he had his Bible, and Vera told us, Papa's Bible has duct tape on it. <laughs> you know why? Because Papa just likes duct tape. No, it's worn out. 
because he's been teaching the Word of God. And last night, he opened the Bible and read part of Psalm 91. Why? Because I wanted our little granddaughter to see not only is Buddha a Bible reader, but Papa is too. What a testimony that a little four-year-old child can say, my Papa read the Bible to me. If you're not reading the scripture as a family, really, it's called a sin of omission. Because you're, we're commanded to read the scriptures. You say, I don't know where to start. Start with this sheep. Start with Proverbs. Start with the Psalms. Do not start with Isaiah. Okay? <laughs> I'm never so glad to get out of Isaiah. Okay? What is your Bible? One more verse with me. Isaiah 57, 15. And there's some great verses in Isaiah, but you've got to dig through a lot of stuff. Read with me. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Quote, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble. And to revive the heart of the contrite ones. I don't want us to have a week of revival. I don't want us to have a week of meetings. You know, most churches only have two or three day revivals now. Who ever heard of a week of revival? Did you used to have two week revivals here years ago? I've been in two week revivals. It's a rare thing, but our attendance grew and grew last year until I believe Thursday or Friday was our highest attendance at the meeting. What will true revival do? Let, let me say this before I get there. Thanks, Jack. I, I, I got a hit. Imagine that. I just want to remind you to take this sheet I've given you. If you're having trouble forgiving yourself, you read this. It's full of biblical principles to help you on that journey. Today's last points are true revival would cause me to do what? Number one, love Jesus more. And by the way, the man who wrote that song, You Are I Am, also posted this on his page this week. And I borrowed it from Dr. Foster. He's 86 years old now and still preaching the Bible. What, 88? 80 something. True revival will not cause me to get up and poop and holler. You might poop and holler. A person of my personality might be hoop and holler. My wife's not going to hoop and holler. She doesn't hoop and holler about anything. You know? Hey, here's you some roses. Well, thank you. You know? I mean, she's excited, but it's not like, woo-hoo. You know? So God uses our temperaments. We praise the Lord with how he made us. Some of you may just tear up. Some of you may just pry, silently pray. But I can tell you this. If you get truly revived, you're going to love Jesus more. And I want to give a commercial to go mix. You'll listen to the right kind of music too. Layla shared with our teenagers two weeks ago. She gave them a listening. A, a, what's it called? Play. Play. A play with. I don't have one. I don't, I don't even play music on my phone. I haven't learned how to do that. Okay. But she gave them a playlist. And she told our young people. I have found in my life. That the music I listen to affects me. You can't love Jesus and listen to some of the garbage that's on some of the airwaves and whatever else you get music from. You'll love Jesus more and it'll affect your listening. Number two, you'll love the Bible more. My Bible's looking sort of worn out for two reasons. I use it a lot, but it's also cheap leather. <laughs> And so it's gonna it's gonna give it's gonna show wear quicker. You know, Papa, I'll have to duct tape my Bible, you know. But you're gonna love that word more. You say, I don't understand all the Bible. Neither do I. But I'm gonna keep reading it. I'll read it till I understand more. Number three, you're gonna love prayer more. And praying with people you love, praying with your children. Some of you, your kids have never heard you pray. What's wrong with you? Because if they don't know 
that you pray, why should they pray? You say, well, I'm shy. Get over it. They need to hear you talk to God on their behalf. <clears throat> and if you can't think of one, write one down and read it to them. Or open up Isaiah. Or open up the, any of these verses and read the prayers of the scripture. Number four, you'll love the church more. I'm not going to preach to the choir here. You're here today. Some of you got here at 10 o'clock. We're still practicing. You'll love being at church. I heard a, a, a George Barna does uh, surveys, and according to most church members, faithful church attendance is once or twice a month. Excuse me. I got that backwards. According to the survey, church members, the majority of them said, if you're faithful to a church, you'll be there every week. You know, otherwise, being sick or out of town. But most clergy that were that were surveyed said, oh, if people show up once or twice a month, I consider that regular. That's not regular. I eat regularly. I eat every day. Okay? Regular practice of doing right. Love the church more. Number five, love lost sinners more. Don't hate them. It doesn't do anybody any good for you to be mad at sinners. Be mad at sin, but love the sinner. You don't hate the sinner. You, you hate the sin that is destroying them. Number six, love to give more. And I rarely mention giving. But this church is generous. And you all have been so faithful. We've paid our bills. We're able to help missionaries. And in the future, if God wills, we're going to help Go mix and help people like David Neff and Micah Griffin and in addition to our SBC missions as God leads the members of this church. Number seven, to love biblical preaching more. Just to love the word of God. More. What does more mean? More than what? The answer is more than you did before the revival came. We've worked so hard for months to get ready for this week of meetings that I am tired. I am weary. But I believe God's going to give us a renewed strength. We're going to keep our seats. Girls, would you come and sing that song for us again? Would you make this a time of prayer right there in your seat? Now, some of you may say, I don't know that I'm a Christian. I don't know that I'm saved. I'm going to be down front for anyone that wants to come and say, i like for somebody to pray with me, somebody to talk to me about my soul. But this song says, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. Let me pray.